Has America always been a melting pot of all peoples from across the earth? A rudimentary understanding of the country's history makes apparent this has not been the case. But what was the reason for the metamorphosis of its ethnic composition? Who was behind it and how was it achieved? Let's take a brief historical journey through the founding of America up until the 20th century with the goal in mind of learning about this demographic shift which has occurred. Just months after passage of the Quebec Act in 1774 which abolished the Protestant oath of office in that territory and gave religious toleration to its Catholics, the Continental Congress in an address to the people of Great Britain, dated October 31, 1774 expressed its amazement that the Parliament of Great Britain would allow the establishment of a religion in Quebec that has quote, deluged their island in blood, and dispersed impiety, bigotry, persecution, murder, and rebellion, unquote. The Congress was concerned that they quote, might become formidable to us, and on occasion, be fit instruments in the hands of power, to reduce the ancient free Protestant colonies to the same state of slavery with themselves, unquote. Following the Revolutionary War which was in part a response to the treasonous Quebec Act, Catholics were not allowed to vote or hold political office in most states well into the early 19th century for apparent reasons. Namely, the doctrines of the Pope's universal spiritual and temporal powers require good Catholics to have an unquestioned allegiance to the papacy. Amidst the wave of Irish famine immigrants to America in the mid-19th century, the topic of anti-Catholicism was heating up, so much so, that an entire political party, the Know Nothings, was created with the intent to ward off foreign Catholic involvement in the political process and to secure the borders of America from further immigrants hostile to the laws and customs of the land. During this time, speeches were openly given in the halls of Congress exposing the Jesuit order and condemning papistry. For example, a speech was given in 1855 by Representative William Russell Smith of Alabama called, The Naturalization Laws, Policy of the Roman Catholic Church, in which Smith emphasized the power of the Jesuits, denounced the influx of Catholics to the country and urged to prevent their further influence. As it would turn out, just as the Catholic question was getting serious attention however, arguments over slavery and the Civil War divided the Know Nothing Party before its agenda could be advanced. By the start of the 20th century, the power of Rome facilitated by the mass immigration of Irish Catholics to America was being solidified. Many books during this time were being written about the Roman Catholic influence over presidents and the political affairs of America. Take for example books written by ex-Catholic priest Jeremiah Crowley, Justin Dewey Fulton, Secretary of the Navy R. W. Thompson etc. As for the lower-class immigrant Catholics, they were quickly able to co-opt the first national labor unions by positioning second-generation Irish immigrant Terence Powderly as their leader. The labor unions were given approval by Pope Leo XIII which led to prominent Catholic priest John A. Ryan's drafting of the bishop's program that later became the basis for New Deal legislation in the 1930s having helped economically elevate this lower class group of Catholic immigrants from the ghettos to the middle class. Catholic archbishops themselves declared what their plans were at this time, to rule America and thereby rule the world. Archbishop Quigley of Chicago said in 1903 in the Chicago Tribune that, within 20 years, this country will rule the world, and that when the United States rules the world, the Roman Catholic Church will rule the world. Quigley said that the kings and queens would pass away and democracies of the United States would replace them, which is exactly the story of the past 60 years of American history, the use of the American military to install phony democracies. By 1908, Rome had declared that America was no more missionary country, but a Catholic country. Its king was James Cardinal Gibbons. In Justin Fulton's book, Washington in the Lap of Rome he says there was known to be a wire between Gibbons' estate in Baltimore and the White House for the presidents to receive instruction from the cardinal. All of this Catholic influence caused discord in America as was depicted in films such as Gangs of New York which eventually led to the passing of the Johnson-Reed Act of 1924 which restricted immigration from virtually everywhere except from northwestern Europe. 
The rules included restrictions from southern and eastern Europe with large concentrations of Italian and Polish Catholics especially seeking to immigrate to America. The Johnson-Reed Act ensured that the vast majority of future immigrants would, in the words of Tennessee Congressman William Vail, become assimilated to our language, customs, and institutions, and blend thoroughly into our body politic. And that language was English, those customs were the white Protestant adherence to the Bible as the word of God and final authority, and the institutions are churches and schools, the latter of which were started by the Puritans, known as the common schools, and in which the Bible was read. This notwithstanding the new Illuminist Enlightenment ideas of Freemasonry, ideas which were not actually new, but were a development of the Neoplatonic perennialist Christian heresy of Meister Eckhart. Such perennialism undoubtedly was the basis for the doctrine of freedom of religion in America. The equality of souls before God which was emphasized by Eckhart has always been a key component of the unbiblical Christian metaphysics, and this soul equality doctrine was integrated into the Enlightenment philosophies. Indeed, there exists a statement of Pope Benedict XVI in his book, Christianity and the Crisis of Cultures, wherein the conservative traditional pontiff Joseph Ratzinger embraces the Christian Church's affinity with the Enlightenment, acknowledging the latter's origin in the former. Quote, as a religion of the persecuted, and as a universal religion that was wider than any one state or people, Christianity, denied the government the right to consider religion as part of the order of the state, thus stating the principle of the liberty of faith. It has always defined men, all men without distinction, as creatures of God, made in his image, proclaiming the principle that they are equal in dignity, though of course within the given limits of societal order. In this sense, the Enlightenment has a Christian origin. And it is not by chance that it was born specially and exclusively within the sphere of the Christian faith, in places where Christianity, contrary to its own nature, had unfortunately become mere tradition and the religion of the state. It was and remains the merit of the Enlightenment to have drawn attention afresh to these original Christian values and to have given reason back its own voice. In its constitution on the Church in the modern world, the Second Vatican Council restated this profound harmony between Christianity and the Enlightenment, seeking to achieve a genuine reconciliation between the Church and modernity. Unquote. Ratzinger, Christianity and the Crisis of Cultures, pages 47, 49. The book also contains a foreword by Marcello Pera, a conservative Italian politician who is a vocal opponent of Pope Francis. So even the perceived right-wing arm of the Catholic Church, consisting largely of the secular priesthood, claims astounding ownership over the European liberal enlightenment. Moreover, the book was published on Ignatius Press, founded by Jesuit priest Joseph Fessio, who was a close associate of Ratzinger. Spanish anthropologist Joan Pau Ruby's documents in his work The Jesuits and the Enlightenment, how the Jesuits were participants in, rather than enemies of the Enlightenment with their engagement in the Republic of Letters and hence their acceptance of cultural modernity. Settings in which egalitarianism prevails have generally been conducive to Catholicism, whereas race realism and hierarchical, aristocratic structures have thrived in Hebraic Protestant countries. We read as such in A History of Political and Religious Persecutions, Volume 2, by Fernando Garrido and Charles Baggett Cayley on page 565. The authors additionally predicted with much accuracy how the cryptically Christian Enlightenment principles tolerated by the Jesuits which naturally progressed, or rather regressed, into full-blown SJW monkish ethics would be used to invigorate traditional Christian resistance led by Rome. Quote, Protestantism has maintained itself and taken root only in countries aristocratic by their nature and constitutions, as are in general those of the north of Europe, where the nobles and the well-to-do classes are everything, and the bulk of the people nothing. These countries underwent with comparative ease the change from Catholicism to Protestantism, though their aristocracies have certainly been involved in formidable controversies with more radical, although still Christian parties. And Protestant they have remained, whereas, in the southern countries, in which the sentiment of equality prevails, Protestantism has not acclimatized itself either through persecutions or without them. And if in some of these Catholicism has decayed, 
or the belief in the Roman dogmas has been weakened, yet this has not been through the influence of another faith, but of philosophy and rationalism, against which all Christian sects will be one day forced to combine by grouping themselves around the Church of Rome as a common center." Unquote. It can also be read from Madison Grant in his, The Passing of the Great Race, how the Catholic Church wherever it can leverage its influence always dissolves racial barriers with its universalism while on the other hand the Calvinistic Hebraic Protestants were race realists. Quote, the Church of Rome has everywhere used its influence to break down racial distinctions. It disregards origins and only requires obedience to the mandates of the universal Church. In that lies the secret of the opposition of Rome to all national movements. In New England, however, whether through the decline of Calvinism or the growth of altruism, there appeared early in the last century a wave of sentimentalism, and in so doing apparently destroyed, to a large extent, pride and consciousness of race in the North. Unquote. Madison Grant, The Passing of the Great Race. Pages 85-86. The ethnic stock of America, all the way up to the mid-1900s was majority white coming from a lineage of mostly Protestant families. As Dr. Fred M. Shelley remarks in his book The World's Population, an encyclopedia of critical issues, crises, and ever-growing countries, page 126, the large majority of native-born Americans at the dawn of the 20th century were Protestants. However, most Southern and Eastern European immigrants were Roman Catholics, Jews or members of Eastern Orthodox churches. And as Wikipedia states, the Johnson-Reed Act was primarily aimed at further restricting immigration of Southern Europeans and Eastern Europeans, especially Italians and Eastern European Jews, 1, 2, 3, in addition, it severely restricted the immigration of Africans and outright banned the immigration of Arabs and Asians. According to the U.S. Department of State Office of the Historian the purpose of the act was to preserve the ideal of American, racial, homogeneity. But this nationalistic act limiting immigration of strange peoples of diverse origins including Papists from Southern and Central Europe came to be overthrown by Roman Catholic legislation called the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965 or the hart seller Act. The precursor to the hart seller Act was the McCarran-Walter Act, also known as the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952 which abolished racial restrictions found in United States immigration and naturalization statutes going back to the Naturalization Act of 1790 which limited citizenship to free white persons of good character. This McCarran-Walter Act was a Romanist document. Pat McCarran was an Irish Roman Catholic. Francis E. Walter was born in Easton, Pennsylvania. He attended Lehigh University, George Washington University, and Georgetown University. The Hart Seller Act was passed one year after the Civil Rights Act, the chief architect of which was Catholic priest Theodore Hesburgh. This was a time for great upheaval by the Jesuits aimed at the final destruction of white Protestant hegemony in America. The Civil Rights Act has been cited as an impetus for the Hart Seller Act, given the political climate. The deceptive narrative was that the act was never meant to change the demographic composition of America, but that is exactly what it has done. Since 1968, according to Alien Nation author Peter Brimelow, 85% of legal immigrants have come from what are euphemistically called developing countries, i.e. third world areas, and 80% of annual population growth in America is from immigration. We now have an electorate that is over one-fourth Catholic, and this majority third-world immigrant part of the electorate heavily reliant on socialist government assistance leading to more socialist-communist policies. The three key individuals behind the Hart Seller Act were Philip Hart, Roman Catholic senator trained by Jesuits at Georgetown University. Emmanuel Seller Jewish congressman who spent considerable effort attempting to re-establish diplomatic relations with the Vatican and Pope Pius XII. Remember, those relations had been cut off since 1867 after Rome's involvement in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. We read in the Papacy in the Age of Totalitarianism, 1914-1958 page 311 by John Pollard, Ph.D. 
Support came from unexpected quarters, like that from the Jewish congressman, Emmanuel Seller, who wrote to the State Department arguing for a resumption of relations with the Vatican in that same month. Here is a picture of Seller when he personally visited the Vatican taken from this eBay listing, 1951 Vatican City Congressman Emmanuel Seller Swiss Guards Pope Pius Press Photo. Seller's full letter can be read here wherein he betrays his own Jewish people inciting invented history seeking to portray the popes as friends of the Jews. What bold papal lies! Needless to say, Seller was a court Jew for the Pope. Ted Kennedy, Roman Catholic senator who helped promote the Hart Seller Act. Notably, it was Kennedy who advanced the deception that the Hart Seller Act would quote, not flood our cities with immigrants. It will not upset the ethnic mix of our society. It will not relax the standards of admission. It will not cause American workers to lose their jobs, unquote, as recorded in the Senate Subcommittee on Immigration and Naturalization of the Committee on the Judiciary, Washington, D.C., February 10, 1965, pages 1 to 3. So viewer I hope it is now clear how and why the Catholic Church and its servants were behind the origin of the demographic shift in America. In summary, Catholicism is universalism. In addition to the allowance for more of their Catholic brethren to immigrate to America outrightly and affect the political system through their harnessing of the institutional church's power, the Catholic Church wanted to increase cosmopolitanism and thereby induce an environment in which the universal Catholic religion would thrive and Protestant elitism would be dismantled. All of this was only possible because certain founders of America had become deluded by Freemasonic perennialism which ultimately came out of the Rhineland Catholic mystical movements. With their freedom of religion error, the founders did not consider the consequences of their embrace of perennialism, having left the door open for the popes to impose temporal power in the country down the road and to thus facilitate the universalist demographic shift conducive to Catholicism. Despite incorporation of Freemasonic doctrines, the founders were highly aristocratic, hearkening back to their Protestant roots. The time period in which the sentiment of egalitarianism started to prevail among the masses was in the late 18th and early 19th centuries during the lead-up to the Jacksonian movement when universal white male suffrage was being implemented in many American states. This was primarily a consequence of the increase of industrialization and population in urban areas. With these changes, property qualifications and religious affiliation were relaxed in favor of race as the criterion for voting and attaining to public office. While racial unity is a positive element for fostering social cohesion, the overemphasis on race as a basis for political equality would lead to the transformation of America as a republic governed by aristocrats to that of a democracy governed by moneyed interests. The details of this transformation are out of the scope of this video, but it is interesting to note that quote, the Jacksonians watched with keen interest the stirrings of revolt abroad. Jackson and his cabinet joined in the celebrations in Washington which followed the Revolution of 1830 in France. Lamennais, the eloquent voice of French popular aspirations, was read in Jacksonian circles. Jacksonians everywhere had this faith in the international significance of their fight. America was the proving ground of democracy and it was the mission of American Democrats to exhibit to the world the glories of government by the people." Lamennais was a French Catholic priest and is considered the forerunner of liberal Catholicism and social Catholicism. So ironically, this preoccupation with race also contributed in some ways to the downfall of racial homogeneity by making exceptions for white Catholics, allowing Romanist Universalists to enter into and eventually dominate all major political platforms. Those opposed to the liberal immigration policies and social progressivism pushed on the American public by the Jesuit-controlled Catholic Church would join dissident political movements also controlled by Rome, formerly known as the alt-right. So either way, it has been a win-win for the Catholic Church. The Protestant establishment has in fact been destroyed. This according to the preeminent scholar of the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who first coined the WASP acronym, E. Digby Baltzell in his book The Protestant Establishment, Aristocracy and Caste in America. 
Baltzell states the authority of Protestant propertied interests in America had been overthrown as early as the time of the book's publication in the 1960s. Obviously, things have only gotten progressively worse for American Protestants since then to the point where there are zero churches left that actually engage in Protestantism, that is denunciation of Rome and the naming of the Pope as Antichrist. If you haven't already, watch my video, The Immigration Invasions Are Catholic Jesuit Controlled, which adds to the veracity and continuity of this presentation's theme.